doctrine. Y'all know what doctrine is? Everybody has a doctrine. It's a system of belief. Could even be a system of unbelief. So everybody has it. That would be their doctrine. The heathen, those that don't know God, they have a system of unbelief. But every believer has a system of belief. Amen. And um, so we're going to talk about doctrine today. We're going to we're going to talk about Jesus. You know what Jesus' doctrine is? We're going to talk about the doctrine of Jesus. We hold the doctrine of Jesus in our hands when we hold the Holy Scriptures. You say, well, why, why then? Why do all of us have so much, so many different doctrines? And, and we look to the same word. Well, it's because we're missing it. This is the truth. Amen. And let God be true. This is God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. So we got some, um, we all probably got some sacred cows in our doctrine that need to be killed. You know what a sacred cow is? It's something in, in your system of belief that don't need to be there. You know the Bible says the tradition of men will make the word of God of non-effect. So we have to be careful not just get, get our doctrine full of the tradition of men. Amen. All right. Praise God. Well, I'm going to tell you this. I'm, I shared this uh, Wednesday night uh, because I'm going to tell you how every one of us has been influenced with our doctrine by two men. One's named Cal John Calvin. And the other's name, Jacob Arminius. Jacob Arminius. I'm going to read you some things about this. See, it's Calvinism and Arminianism. They're two systems of theology that attempt to explain the relationship between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility when it comes to salvation. Uh, John Calvin was a, was a French theologian, lived in, from 1509 to 1564. Arminius was a, Jacob Arminius was a Dutch theologian who lived from 1560 to 1609. Now, I'm, I, I can't go into complete detail, but I'm, I want, you need to be taking some notes because what I'm talking about has affected our theology in a great way. Calvinism includes the belief that election is unconditional, while Arminianism believes in conditional election. Unconditional election is the view that God elects individuals to salvation based entirely on His will, not on anything in born worthy in any in individual. In other words, God has already decided who is going to be saved and who ain't going to be saved. That's, that's the ultimate Calvinistic doctrine when it comes to salvation. Conditional election states that God elects individuals to salvation based on, yes, based on his foreknowledge because he knows all things of those who will believe in Christ unto salvation thereby on the condition that the individual chooses Jesus. See, Calvinism sees the atonement as limited, where Arminianism sees it as unlimited. And, that, and this is the most controversial point of these two systems. Limited atonement is the belief that Jesus only died for the elect. He'd already elected them. He already said, these are the ones that's going, I'm going to save. Unlimited atonement is the belief that Jesus died for all, but his death is not effectual until a person receives him by faith. In other words, what Jesus did, he did it for all. In his death, burial, and resurrection. 
He did. He's, he paid the price to save the whole world of humanity. But they don't. They don't have it until they make an individual choice to receive what he's done for them. And when they make that choice, they have to do what the Bible calls repentance. They have to make a decision. They're no longer going to go the way they've been going in life. And they're going to turn and put their faith and trust in the way that God has provided through his son, Jesus Christ. As the way, the truth, and the life. As Lord. So you can't just be Savior. Oh, most of the world out there will tell you that Jesus is the Savior. But you got you to know Him as Lord. And then He really becomes your Savior. And we'll touch on that a little bit later here. Calvinism includes the belief that God's grace is irresistible, or Arminianism says that an individual can resist the grace of God. I don't know about you, but for years I resisted the grace of God before I made a quality decision to accept what Jesus Christ had done for me. Faith came by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Ah. Uh, Arminianism believes that an individual can resist that grace of God. Irresistible grace argues that when God calls a person to salvation, that person is certain to come to salvation. Resistible grace states that God calls all to salvation. I believe he has, don't you? Not God's will that any perish. Resistible grace states that God calls all to salvation, but many people resist and reject that call. Calvinism holds to perseverance of the saints, while Arminianism holds to conditional salvation. Perseverance of the saints refers to the concept that a person who is elected by God will persevere in faith and will not permanently deny Christ or turn away from Him. Conditional salvation is the view that a believer in Christ can, of his or her free will, turn away from Christ and thereby lose salvation. Now let me make this note. There are many Armenians that deny conditional salvation and instead hold to eternal security. I guess to give you an example, how many of y'all was ever in a Baptist church? Let me see your hand. Most, you know, we're in Baptist country down here, southeast Alabama, and as a matter of fact, the Bible Belt. Amen. Sometimes you think there's more Baptists than there are Christians. But they're the ones they believe. They believe that God has saved the whole world. That. And any, anyone that will put their faith in Jesus Christ can be saved. But then they come up, they, then they, they pick up on the Calvinistic doctrine that, that uh, you know, they can never lose that salvation once they have it. Well, I agree. I don't know why anyone would want to lose it. But we still have a free will. And God never violates man's free will. In other words, God only has the control that we give to him. You know why our country's in the mess it's in? Because, because the people in America, and especially the church in America, and I'm talking about the whole church now, has not yielded control to God. I'll just let that sink in a little bit. See, God is only in control where he is given control. Now just take, take your life personally. He didn't have control of your life until you yielded and gave your life to him. To control. That's what Lord means. Lord means then I yield my life to the control of God. 
through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, Jesus now is my boss. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, in the diversity of the body of Christ, there's all sorts of mixture of Calvinism and Arminianism. All kinds of mixes. We've all, whether we want to admit it or not, we've got some of the uh, Calvin's and some of, some of Arminius's theology in our system of belief. And you know whose theology we need is Jesus' theology. Amen? And we're going to look at the most important part of Jesus' theology today. I believe it's the most important part of his theology. And when we get a revelation of what I'm going to share with you today, you'll see then how it affects the rest of your theology when you read and study this Holy Scripture. Because this is, this is the will of God. This is God speaking to us. This is God's manufacturer's handbook. You believe He created us? He gave His creator creation a book to go by that will tell us how to live, how to act, and what our theology should be. So, what, what about the, 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 the doctrine of Jesus? Well, we, we've established that uh, the total Word of God is His theology, but there's a part of His theology I believe is the most important part of His theology that will help us understand all His theology. And that theology is the system of justice that God has established in the earth. He's established a system of justice. We call it sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. We call it seed, plant, harvest. And we're all cons consistently in our lives sowing seeds. We sow good seeds, we sow bad seeds. And the Word of God plainly teaches that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. Paul picked up on this, made it very plain in Galatians 6, 7. Uh, we, need, we need to look at that description. Let's turn over the, to uh, Galatians chapter 6, uh, verse 7. And as a matter of fact, I want to I go there and I want to pick up on a couple of verses before that. We'll start with verse 6. It says, Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. I like that. Amen. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever. Do y'all know what the word whatever means? It means, it means whatsoever means whatsoever. That's what it means. Whatsoever. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. And notice that God puts the emphasis, now don't be deceived. Whatsoever a man sows, that, that word man there is referring to a human being. Whatsoever a human being soul, sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. In due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In other words, we'll reap those good things that we've sown if we don't lose heart. And uh, really, if you don't do something about those bad seeds you've sown, you'll reap them too. But thank God for the grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's 
through his death, burial, and resurrection, he's done something for us, given us the better covenant with better promises. He's done something for us through his grace that we can do about bad seeds that we sow where we will not have a crop of badness but we we we'll, we'll, we can we can eliminate and stop eliminate bad harvests on bad seeds and we'll get into that before we get through here so the question is and let me say this getting back to doctrine I don't have these statistics right in front of me. I shared them Wednesday night. But the, what is considered the charismatic movement across the earth today, that includes uh, Pentecostals, charismatics, and all those, in other words, all those that have come into, that have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. They haven't rejected what Jesus does when he baptizes the believer in the Holy Spirit. They accept that, and of course, they accept all, you know, that they don't, they don't believe that uh, all the gifts of the Spirit have ceased and all that. We believe God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The change has come in man, mankind, not God. God never changes. God never changes. So, charismatic is now one of the largest movements of uh, believers on the face of the earth. They estimate there's 700 million believers in the charismatic movement that come from all these different streams of theology. And of course, you know, that can make a mess. If we don't stick with the Word of God. And um, so um, that's why we need to test what we hear to the Word of God. We need to continue to stay with the foundational doctrines that Jesus has given in the Scriptures. That You know, Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus uh, walked this earth as perfectly before Heavenly Father, the only man that was able to do that he's called the second Adam where the first Adam fell the second Adam didn't fall he was tempted in every point to sin even as we're tempted yet he 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 was without sin in other words he was tempted but he did not yield to the temptations and uh, he was able to present himself to the holy God father as a lamb of God perfect without sins that could be slain for our sins as our substitute on the cross. And that's exactly what he did as the Lamb of God. He died for our sins on the cross. Went to hell itself. He, he tasted every death. He tasted every death that mankind would taste. If he didn't do it, if he didn't taste it, we'd have to taste it. We'd have to experience it. But he tasted all the three deaths. We won't go on all that. But uh, he tasted every death that mankind will, will, would or could suffer. And he was raised from the dead for our justification. If he had not been raised from the dead, we would not be able to stand before God, holy God today. But because we put our faith and trust in him who was raised from the dead for our justification, then we, put, we, we can come into a, into a relationship with a holy God. That's why he came, to bring the life of God back to humanity that they had lost in the fall. That's why Jesus came, not to establish some religion, but to bring the life of God back to humanity. And that's exactly what he did. So, uh, all these, you know, there's so many, 
from all these different streams that's come into the river, the charismatic river, that uh, it's like a like a when a flood, you know, when you have a flood, you know, it goes all all out from, uh, from the banks, you know, and it causes a lot of mess, damage. Amen. So uh, we have to be careful then. We have to continually stick with the Word of God because of, because of all these different uh, realms of doctrine that's come into this flow, you know, uh, there's a lot of error. Amen. That we have to be careful of. But getting back here, see, if we we'll get, we'll get a, a revelation of this most important part of Jesus' doctrine, which is, that God has established in the earth this law of justice. You know, if God was not a just God, he wouldn't be a good God. He has to, he has to, he has to punish evil. He has to punish sin. And uh, he had to, and if, if we didn't accept Jesus, who has already taken our punishment for us, he would have to punish that in our life. And he would still, he still gives us the scripture in, in 1 John 1, 9. It's written plainly to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not written to anybody else. It's written to the church. John makes that very plain. The, the, the first epistle of, of St. John that, that is written to the church. He says to the believer now, if we have an advocate with the Father, and if we confess our sin." That means we still have the capability to sin as believers. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Cleanse us. That blood still works on our behalf. That blood will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to repent when we miss the mark. One of the worst doctrines that's come into this charismatic stream is a doctrine out of the hell itself, I believe, that tells, it says, when a, once we get born again, we never have to repent again. Well, if you read the Bible, you cannot accept that. Why would John say, if we confess our sin, he's writing to the church. He's not writing to unbelievers. He says, if we confess our sin, he is, we, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, thank God, when we got born again, he did that for us. He, he wiped the past away. But I believe most of us has got some past since we became a believer that needs to be wiped away. And he made provision for that. Now getting back to sowing and reaping. How do you sow seeds? We need to know how we sow seeds. The most and the primary way that we sow seeds is with our mouth. With our mouth. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 37. He said, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. We see that in salvation. Oh, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The primary way we sow seeds is with our mouth, and the next is our actions. You, you know, you can't just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and continue to live a life of habitual sin. And we've discussed this this week, Don and I, looking looking at society today and look, looking at those who say they're Christians, at, they, at one point, many, we know at one point they, they supposedly made some kind of commitment in church, 
yet they're, re, re, they're living today, not married, but living with, with another person. The Bible calls that fornication. And he says no fornications will go to, fornicators will go to heaven. So if they stay in that, stay in that state, they, they will, in a habitual state of being a fornicator, they will not go to heaven according to the word of God, according to the doctrine of Jesus. See why we need, as the body of Christ, we need to be praying 90, we need to be interceding and travailing 90% of the time in our prayer life. So our actions. Now this is something that we, we need to get a hold of too. These, these, these parts of the Word of God that tells us that even our intentions can, you can sow a bad seed with your intentions. Jesus made that very plain when he talked about adultery over in Matthew 5, 27, 28. He said, if you heard it said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in her heart. Now, that don't mean every time a man looks at a woman, he's committing adultery. It means that he's, he's looking at her w with this in mind. If I can get her alone and she will have sex with me, then I will have sex with her. Then you've already committed it in your heart. And that's sowing a seed. And there's other instances in the Word of God we could get into, if, but for lack of time. You'll see these if you get a hold of this revelation of sowing and reaping. Can we see the importance of confession? What we say are seeds, bad or good. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now what is the greatest seed we sow? The greatest seed we sow is the Word of God. When we confess and when we share and we confess the Word of God, we're sowing the best seed we can sow. It's a pure seed. And it will, it will produce a, a good, pure harvest in our lives if we faint not. If we faint not. Jesus so many times in the scriptures, in the, in the gospels, so many times he would, he would, he, he, he shared parables of the sower, the seed and the sower, trying to get across to humanity this law of justice that's in the earth, sowing and reaping. One of his, uh, I believe one of the most important uh, revelational parables that I've been able to get a hold of is what we call the parable of the sower or really the parable of the uh, seed that is sown and, the, and what it is sown into. The condition of the soil that it is sown into. And that's the parable we find over in Mark chapter 4 beginning with verse 3 it says listen, behold in other words, when God says, listen, behold, he's letting us know he's fixing to say something here very important. Hearken. King James says, hearken and behold. He's, tell, he's, he's telling us, listen. You're fixing to hear something that's really important for your life. Something really important for you to, to know, for you to understand. A sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that birds, that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not much have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew and choked it, and it yielded no crop. 
But other seeds fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up and increased and produced some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. Brother Jim, in his prayer the day over the tithes and offerings, he made reference to the 30, 60, 100-fold return that can be on a seed that's sown in the right soil. Now, Jesus has to explain this to his apostles. He's explaining this to, not only did he explain it to his disciples, but he's explaining it to us now, down in verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand? Now he, he's telling us about the first soil here. He said, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, this is something that if we don't get a hold of, we'll not understand all the other parables that he shares. The sower sows the word. We're sowers. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He uses his demons to come and steal that word. That is on hard hearted people. And let me tell you this a lot of Christians have become hard hearted Christians. Then verse 16, he says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word immediately receive it with all gladness, and when they have but, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. How many Christians are we seeing stumbling today? Now, look at this. First of all, they immediately allows the enemy to come steal the word from my heart. Second stall. The problems of life and persecution of the world cause them to walk away from what they hear. That's the way the enemy is. See, when we, when we hear the word, the enemy comes immediately, works to steal the word that we've heard from the heart. Even new revelation that comes to the believer's heart. And the reason he can steal it is because there's so many sacred cows in our systems of belief. He'll begin to speak words of doubt into our thoughts just as he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. How he speaks to people when God's dealing with their hearts to receive Jesus. You don't really believe this. That's not, that'll not work for you. You're not good enough. You've got to get better before you, this can happen to you. Because we know we can't get better without him. How do you know that's true? That's just a man speaking. And then down here in the second soul, the problems of life come to us all. He said, but Jesus told us, in this world you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tests. You're going to have pressures on you. You're going to have persecutions. But fear not, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We don't have to fear this virus. He's overcome that virus. The invitation of God is to cast all our care on Him, for He cares for us, to draw strength and help from the Word of God. And to make our minds up that God's word is the truth. Jesus said his word is truth. And God has given us everything we need for life and to live a life pleasing to him through faith in his word. It's our choice. The third soul. 
Now these are the ones sown among thorns, that they are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness, riches, desire for other things, enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The cares of life and the love of money and things cause them to walk away. The Bible says it's the love of money and the root of all evil. Not that God don't want you to have money. Let me tell you, it's, going, it's hard to exist in this world without some money. He means for us to possess money, but for it to not to possess us. Some of the poorest people I know in the world, they have no money, but they love money. They love money. They'll go from church to church beating, beating churches out of money, some of them. Why we have to be wise as serpents. God enjoys blessing his children. He provides means by which we can prosper by using our gifts and talents. So when our time and finances into God's work, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. And using the money we have to help others. Jesus said, Give. In other words, what you gave then will be multiplied back to you. If we will seek God and His kingdom first, everything we need in this life will be added unto us. Again, we must choose. The choice is ours. Then the fourth seed. I love this one, don't you? And these are the ones, this is verse 20, and these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word. They really hear the word, but they don't just hear it, they accept it. And bear fruit. Notice that. They hear it, they accept it, and it bears fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. Hear the word, believe it, and act on it, it produces much fruit. Blessed, then you, it, it, the heart's blessed, a heart that is humble and honest enough to recognize the words it's hearing is God speaking to it. Just simply believe. You know, the gospel is simple. The good news of what Jesus has done for us is simple. It's not that he doesn't want it to be complicated. The enemy makes it. Enemy and religion, and of course he uses religion to make it hard, complicated. So we don't need to, when the word's taught, we need to choose to hear it. Not to allow anything to keep us from hearing. Listen intently, asking the Holy Spirit to give us understanding. Ask yourself how you can apply what you've heard. How should I obey this? In other words, never allow yourself to just be a hearer and not a doer. Determine you'll be a doer of the word you hear. When you hear the word, believe it and begin acting on it. And God will give you more understanding. See, Revelation is progressive. Line on line, precept upon precept here, a little bit there, a little bit. It's progressive. But you've got to stay in it for it to be progressive. You've got to hear it. And when you really hear it, you've got to act on it. Amen. Be diligent to put the word you hear in practice. And understand, just like the farmer sowing seeds in his garden or fields, once it's sown, it's going to grow and a harvest will come. Be confident in the work of the Word in your heart. For that is the soil where the Word must grow. See, this is referring to spiritual harvests. The soil is our hearts. That's why the Bible tells us, guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart. 
out of it, out of it spring the issues of life. If you choose to be a hearer and a doer of the word, your life will begin producing fruit for the kingdom. You will see the fruit of God's word in your life. And your loved ones and others. So God has placed before us two completely different paths. One is life. The other is death. The other is blessing or curses. He even pleads with us in to choose life. And blessing. He pleads with us there to give us life and blessing. But it's our choice. See, if God did it without our help, it wouldn't be our choice. He's telling us here, we've got to choose. We've got to, in other words, we've got to yield our will to His will. His will is life and blessing. Life and blessings. That's it. It's, it's my choice. It's my choice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.